Yeah. Hi, I'm Gary from learntoplaymusic.com and today my special guest is Tom Hoffmeyer, guitarist, vocalist and sound engineer from Adelaide, Australia. How you going, Tom? Good day, how are you? You're not bad. Uh, we're here to inspire, inform and interact, so don't forget your Q&A apps and your headphones. So Tom, that was pretty cool. You were using a tremolo pedal there, I Thank see. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I, uh, what, would you like me to get into them first? or? How we can, like we can do that. Well, first I'd like to ask you how you got started in music. What, what inspired you and why are you here now? Oh, uh, music's probably been the, uh, the main, the, one of the main passions of my life, obviously. That's why I'm here. Um, uh, when I started with music, uh, I remember my earliest, my earliest memory is uh, actually going on road trips with my parents and listening to the Bee Gees on a, on a cassette cool. and uh, just, you know, uh, uh, got to get a message to you and... Uh, down in Massachusetts and but it's so just, the early Bee Gees. Yeah, yeah, really good, cool like, stuff. Really good stuff. And then uh, when I was about eight, my mum uh, took down an acoustic guitar from a shelf in a cupboard I never knew we had and said, "Would you like to learn guitar, Tom?" And I look, took one look at it and just as a as a kid got really excited and and uh, took up lessons really quickly. And I used to I started out I hated playing with um with a pick, so I played with my thumbs for about. A year, and then I got into the pick. But um, but mainly, like uh, when I was a child, I wanted to play was because uh, I, lis I was listening to more contemporary music at that point. You know, Backstreet Boys, Hanson, stuff like that. Yeah. But then I uh, then I heard uh, the Offspring, uh, Pretty Fly for a White Guy, and I just I wanted to be able to play all those riffs and and just uh, yeah, rock it out really, <laughs> just uh, just go from there. So yeah, and then yeah. Uh, then you um. Had some education musically, some formal yeah. education. What, what so kind of that? all through primary school and all through high school, I, I was lucky enough to uh, to have music lessons with a with the individual teacher, and that that just helped me hone in all of my like techniques and 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 skills that I apply today. So uh, uh, as soon as I got into um, high school, I was it was very it was very rhythm. Uh, rhythm oriented and stuff so I learned uh, uh, bar chords were probably a big thing that I learned just to just to be able to um, just to be able to play every note clearly and let it uh, let it all ring out because that when you're young that's very hard cause, yes because you've got uh, little hands little hands soft hands yeah. um, it's a great moment actually for most most guitarists yeah. when they can actually play exactly a bar chord and like you just did that was so that it's heard. My my high school teacher actually said that to me. As soon as you you know once you once you you hear every single note ring out, you've got it, and you can't. It's like riding a bike; you never really forget. Yeah. So, um, on on top of uh, on top of learning music lessons with a teacher, I also uh, studied theory in my music class uh, uh, at high school. And uh, at first, I I took it up a bit. I was a bit clunky trying to find out. Or trying to work out what the you know all these black dots what what are these that you know for the notes and things like that but with a little bit more persistence I, I just I was able to get an understanding and it just and my skills just kind of went up from there so from between the ages of 13 and 15 was when it really started developing okay so, so you, you think studying theory was, was definitely an advantage helping oh, you as absolutely. a professional music absolutely. musician yeah um, cool. Like and even in in primary school, I, I was actually learning with learn to play music books, beginning uh -huh. books, and uh, and my teacher was was teaching me. We we learned together how to read basic notes, and it just it kind of built from there as I got into high school. I'll say like the the that that grounding was the best way that I learned chords and all the techniques as as I progressed through high school. So, like in in my opinion, the best way to learn a chord is if you can if you can master all of the single notes. First, you know, your teacher can say, you know, play a, play a C up here, play a, play an E here, put a C here, and that's the C chord. Instead of just jumping into, you know, put your fingers there. Understanding the C chord. Exactly. What what the components are, as we talked about many times. Yeah. You know, the root, the third, and the fifth. Exactly. Is the, the basis of any chord. So um, eventually, you started doing some professional gigs. Yeah. I, uh, in a, 2002, I started. Uh, Jamming with some friends in the, in their granny flat, and um, we formed our own band called uh, Forget All This. After after many uh, 
name changes and we were like an alternative rock kind of metal band and uh, it wasn't until about 2006 that we um, actually started gigging prevalently around Adelaide and we uh, we got lumped into the into the metal scene and yeah. uh, formed very like a lot of good friendships with people and it was just really it was just a good time and as much as as much as uh, it wasn't it, the shows weren't big on any scale but it was just it was fun to be experiencing that and to and to give it a go and to to you know organizing your own gigs organizing your own shows is just a it's a really good feeling to show yourself that you're capable of yeah. of uh, progressing and doing really well for yourself yeah so, so lots of lots of pub gigs and yeah uh, the real ground root sort of yeah. scene which is yeah. really where anything starts absolutely I think, where usually, absolutely usually great acts flower from or die whatever <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, unfortunately we we did um we did split up in 2011 uh but since then i'd I can never, I can, music's one of those things you can never really give up, you know, even if you've just got a guitar lying around at home that you can just pick up any time. But at the moment, I'm jamming with friends back on guitar, but before that I was playing bass in an indie band called The Sarves, and yeah. we, that was, uh, it was kind of like um, The Strokes, kind of like The Cribs kind of sound, so that kind of um, uh, uh, British-American melding of uh, punk and indie rock and garage and stuff, so... That was really that was good fun as well. Cool. So. And you're um you're part of the LTP team. Yes, I am. Which is, is part of what you're doing now, as well as, as 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 that. What else are you doing musically now? Musically, as I say, I'm just yes. like just jamming with friends, and um I I've, I've really taken up to uh, learning uh, covers of other bands, and hope to actually get some uh, uh, some. I'd love to pursue some work uh, either playing at. Uh, pubs and clubs or even corporate gigs with the band for weddings or, or yeah. functions things like that because it's you know, playing other people's music and stuff is, is really good fun and you can connect with other people and stuff yeah. like that and it's just one of those things that I really enjoy doing so and that's that's what I that's the direction I'm taking at the moment the okay. focus, so. so that's what you'd like to do playing wise in the future yeah yeah okay. uh, and like you know open open mic nights as well as some of the some of the funnest times when you can just meet strangers but just Every, like because music's such a universal language, you can you can just walk into anywhere, and if someone knows the same song as you, you can just jam out on it, and it's it's a really great feeling to to connect with people on that level. That's right, and you, that's a good comment. It is a universal language, and it can be done anywhere in the world. Mm. And most people around the world, in my um, experience, know all of the great songs. Absolutely. Um, and you, they, they don't play them with an accent, unless they're, <laughs> unless they're singing, of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I just in, it's it's funny you mentioned that. I just got back from um, overseas and I, I met up with some uh, some mutual friends uh, in just in a barn out in the country in Canada and uh, they they had a, a, a stage and some amps set up and they asked me if I knew a couple of Jimi Hendrix songs and sure enough we we just started jamming out these songs. I was on bass and it was just it, as you say it's a universal language. Everyone knew the same thing and it was just uncanny to walk into that and be able to play and have yeah. fun and yeah. everyone know what they're doing. Yeah, it and it's a, it's a form of communication that can do nothing but make people smile, really. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's nothing to argue about in, you know, in, a, in a situation where you'd have nothing to talk about because you didn't understand yeah. each other. And that's All why of a sudden that's, you're having that's why I love that a music. conversation. A little bit like the Close Encounters thing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, your topic uh, today is... Um, Effects pedals. Yes. You have a range here on the floor, which unfortunately nobody can see, but it's very I'll be, hard. I'll be, I'll be showing them. So. Yeah, and they'll, they'll also be on the the blog afterwards to yeah. view, I believe. And you can also email um, your thoughts in and uh, participate on the blog afterwards as well. So don't forget that. So you have a range here, Tom. Tell us about them one by one. Well, uh, basically, I've got a couple of. Pedals, uh, effects pedals essentially are they're they're split into a couple of categories. So you can have things like uh, distortion and modulation, delay, uh, filters, things like that. And so today I've got half a dozen pedals. I've got a distortion pedal. I've got two modulation pedals, a delay pedal, a tremolo, as we heard at the start of this uh, webcast, and I've got a wah pedal. Uh, First, I'll start off. Do you want me to just? Well, let's start with the tremolo because everyone heard that. So no worries. Well, that's okay. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> the tremolo is a, its one of my favourite pedals. I'll—I'll I'll just quickly 
unplug it so I everyone guess, can uh, see. Dave Gilmore might have made this one. It was actually it was developed in the in the 1950s. It was put into uh, Fender uh, Vibrolux and Fender uh, Princeton amps, and basically it's a, it's a very simple uh, setup. It's just it's a circuit which basically just has a a, a cutoff um, a cutoff function in it that you can vary by increments. So if you can if you can imagine uh, the signals flowing through here, so this is a signal going past, and the tremolo is just literally letting it go at varying like a, times. Like a valve. Like a valve. So, yeah. so you, you get that, the bup, bup, bup. So obviously, sound, and Tom, so. you've obviously learned this sort of stuff through your um, studying yes, uh, yes. sound engineering. Yeah, So exactly. there's another benefit from... Yeah, well, that's one of the things. You have an understanding of sound yeah. down to... Because I had no idea yeah. myself about that. Exactly. So now I know a little bit more about tremolo pedals. Absolutely. Sound, like, when, when you can break sound down to uh, the level that it is as just a... A bunch of vibrations through the air. Your understanding of and, and enjoyment of music yeah. just like just uh, yeah. accentuates everything. So yeah. Um, so this is the this is the the Boss Tremolo pedal. Once again, we'll be um, we'll be putting these on the blog after. Um, it's got three controls. You've got your the rate, so you can uh, as quickly or as slowly. Uh, you can the speed of the tremolo. The speed of the yeah. tremolo. The wave. So you can either make it. A triangle wave, which makes a, a soft old school vibrato, so it's not as um, not as pronounced, all the way to a square wave, which gives you that pronounced like uh, scoop, like on off the really yeah. uh, uh, chop, choppy one. And then the depth is just how much uh, how much of this pedal is mixed into your audio signal. Yeah. So you can you can have it subtly or very uh, heavily in the mix. Can you just give us another quick demo sure. of that one before we move no on? Worries. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, very evocative sound. Very film tracky sort mm. of sound. I like find that it, yeah, it's it's a very it's a very atmospheric effect. I think yeah. it's used it's it's best used yeah very either subtly or or uh, atmospherically to add texture and depth to yeah. to things. Yeah, it, I do. I hear it a lot on um on the, you hear it a lot on the country and also yeah like a lot of a lot of like one little shots of uh, of many many films also like uh, most prevalently in the west and stuff like that. Yeah, like. like uh, Django, exactly. Django Unchained, yep. stuff like that. Um, yeah. How about the Little Big Muff? Interesting big title. Muff. <laughs> so the the Little Big Muff is uh, is an electro harmonics made uh, uh, pedal. It's a distortion. It falls under the. Oops, excuse me. <laughs> it falls under the distortion um, category. So normally it's a uh, it's uh, actually. Um, much larger, but this is for the sake of convenience. It's uh, it's very small, so it does exactly the same thing as a as a large as the the original Big Muff, which is probably twice the size. It's just a, a simple diecast box and uses some uh, uh, some patented transistors to create anything from like a creamy bassy distortion to a, like a, a sizzling frying lead tone. It was. Uh, it was made in New York in 1966 and and then released in 1969. Is it electro Yeah, it is made yeah. in uh, New York and um, uh, basically it was created because people wanted that that the edgy distorted tones that were coming out from the from the, the 60s and into the 70s and also to to try and emulate that that arbiter fuzz face tone that was made so famous by Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah. Can I you just, hear it? Yes, definitely, definitely. It's the, it's one of those pedals that's just really fun to just plug in and crank. Uh, oh, oops. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so you can go anywhere. So. 
that's that's pretty that's, that's pretty, pretty tame actually. <laughs> yeah, but it sounds quite tough. <laughs> Yeah. Cool. So. And then we've got uh, an MXR Phase 90. I actually own one of these, one oh, of yeah. my favourite pedals. Yeah, the, uh, the Pink Floyd pedal. Yeah, that's it. Um, this is this is my, my latest pedal. I bought this about, I reckon, about three months ago. Oh, three or six months ago. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> sure. Bloody hell. I'm sorry. <laughs> my apologies. That's it. Um, we're now we're censored. <laughs> <laughs> So the MXR Phase 90, it's a really simple setup. It's just one 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 knob which controls the speed, and um, the the MXR the Phase 90 is a is a phase shifter pedal or a phaser. Uh, it was created in uh, the mid 60s, and then it wasn't related, uh, released rather until uh, the 1970s. And as as I mentioned earlier, it's a one. It, the sound is made famous by uh, uh, players like Pink Floyd and more contemporary players. Uh, yeah. I heard it. I first heard it through um, listening to Mike Einzinger from uh, Incubus, and yeah. and I just fell in love with uh, just how it made the guitar sound. It yeah. just it gives it it's gives used a, a lot in funk music too. Exactly. Sort of the, the E9 sort of riff that a lot of funk guitarists play. Yeah, and it's it just it's a nice flying sound. It, I think it's a very it's like a lush a very a very lush sound, and yeah. as I'll demonstrate in a second. It's just yeah, adds a lot of lot of texture. It's one of those atmospheric pedals once again. Oops. Just bear with me, excuse me. Oh. So don't forget you can blog any questions <laughs> at the moment too. Okay. Here we go. Sorry. There it is. So yeah, and you can, and so that can be varied at varying speeds. So as you can hear, it's yeah. the waves are closer together. And so what that actually is, it's and called. That's the I'm gonna be sick sound. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like you're just getting dizzier and dizzier, <laughs> like a washing machine. Yeah. Um, that's it's created by a, a comb filtering. So basically, there's a, there's circuitry in there that once again you've got the signal, the the audio signal going through of the guitar, and uh, there's there's peaks and notches which are created by the circuitry, and that modulates up and down the the audio spectrum of a frequency or of the signal. So. Um, so that's going up and down and creating notches and peaks on the guitar sound, and that's okay. what gives it that characteristic. Similar to a, um, a chorus, exactly to a degree, and a tremolo as well. Before, yeah, similar sort of effects, yeah, but but, but very different in their own way as exactly. well. Exactly. So we have a flanger as well. This is probably my my favourite pedal. Yeah. It's a uh, my my one of my favourite guitarists is. Uh, Rage Against the Machines, Tom Morello, and I, I was able to, I was lucky enough to, to find this pedal and pick it up. It's a Ibanez DFL digital flanger. It was made in Japan in the mid 80s, and it was, uh, it was one of the first uh, flangers made by Ibanez to actually feature digital circuitry rather than so branching off from the, uh, the uh, analog roots. Yeah. And so it gives it this instead of, instead of like a warm rounded sound that you'd get from analog pedals it's this it's a kind of you 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 hear it's a kind of uh, got this crisp metallic characteristic Brittle, to it yeah yeah but um yeah. and it can give you and the, the it can give you anything from a yeah like a watery oozing sound to that the jet sound which a which a flanger is um is a uh, known best for <laughs> Wider and yeah, it's just uh, it's just got this yeah like a I wouldn't say sterile but it's got yeah, this, this hollow almost. hollow sound. Yeah. Probably can't hear that on the 
Holy Shy. Trust us, we know what we're talking about. <laughs> It's an instantly recognizable sound. Yeah. I'm hearing a few tunes that, that I can't do a brass one, but yeah, definitely got an 80s sound about it, yeah. that's for sure. And the, the interesting thing about a flanger is, is it was actually created, it was one of those effects that were created out of, uh, by accident. Um, it was like it was a first, first discovered, basically, well, it's said to be in the 40s by Les Paul, who created yeah. Gibson guitars. Uh, but it was it was uh, mainstream. The mainstream uh, use of it was um, uh, the Beatles engineer George Martin was working with uh, John or John Lennon. Martin. John Lennon asked him if he could uh, if he was able to create a, uh, a double tracking vocal system. Oh, so this he is did, the so he had to revolving do, Leslie thing. Well, he had to. It, it was so he didn't have to track his vocals yeah. twice because he, he used to hate recording because yeah. he thought he was a bad he hated singer. Hated the sound of his own voice. Yeah. So, so what they ended up doing was taking uh, two identical signals on the tape machines, and uh, and at one point George ac accidentally um, lent over one of them, and it and it slowed it down very slightly. And so what it, what it is is it creates a delayed a delayed split of one of the signals. And once again, like the related to the phaser, it creates notches and peaks. And so once again, you you can hear that. You can kind of hear that it, it, instead of um, instead of going back and forth. It, yeah, as you say, as you said before, it kind of um, it kind of goes out. Yeah, out it's the comb filtering. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Bit of, bit John, of just while we're on that, John used to sing through a revolving Leslie speaker yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. That's how he got that sound from Tomorrow Never Knows. He yeah. wanted something that. That made him sound like he was singing from a hilltop. Yeah. So interesting that the Beatles were the ones that were were, were creating all of these new um, yeah. techniques that we're still using today, and we're yeah. still in awe of you know, oh, what they were doing in such a short amount of time. Absolutely. In fact, we have to have a show dedicated to them. I think. Yeah. It's fascinating the like the the, the pioneers such as Pink Floyd, Alan Parsons Project, yeah. the Beatles, just the the sounds they created, they, they, it's funny, it's funny to think they probably didn't think much that they were creating history. That's right. You know exactly. They were just doing, going to work and doing their job. Yeah. 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 And they had some bright ideas. That uh, tales of mystery and imagination by Edgar Allan, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, right. uh, the Alan Parsons project, yeah. is one of my favourite albums. Ah. That's fantastic. So wonderfully recorded. All down in Abbey Road too. So that's that's an album worth checking out. Nice. Okay, and now we have the Marshall oh, Echo no. Head Delay. If, uh, if it's going to be... Oh, hey, it works! It's <laughs> so a delay pedal is uh, it's a, it's an echo, essentially. Basically, it takes, it takes the, the audio signal, puts it into a storage medium, which is through the, the circuitry in the, in the pedal, and then it, uh, and it spits it out, essentially, as an echo at varying increments which you can control which is known as the the feedback on the uh, the feedback knob which you can control on the on the pedal so and then you can also control the speed and the delay time so as you can hear yeah closer yep and then you can you can just get the the, the slap back which yeah. is the rockabilly yeah and then uh, down to uh, yeah really the like you can almost make it a loop. Yeah. yeah. Good ways of jam <laughs> ways of jamming along with yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's cool. Pedal. So I'll just I'll quickly so everyone can see. It's a Marshall Echo Head. It's got uh, it's got it, you can choose five different modes. So what I just had it on was was digital. You can go analog or tape okay. delay, which is how it was originally created, all the way to things like reverse delay and modulation, which is gets a bit funky. Yeah. Um, that's that's one the one of the things I love about pedals is just the, the possibilities. Yeah. You can just sit for hours and 
really hone what you what you're after. What you if you've got a sound in your head or an idea in your head, these these yeah. are a great way to translate. They can actualize them. Say. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And lastly, probably the most famous guitar pedal, I guess, um, of them all, um, it's the wah pedal. Uh, without the wah pedal, we wouldn't have uh, soundtracks to porn music. <laughs> Absolutely. The wah pedal is uh, <laughs> the funky uh, chicken picking. That's it. It's one of those pedals. Um, basically, it's a, it's uh, once again a transistor, and, and uh, it was created by um, the Warwick and uh, Thomas Organ companies. I, I could, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And uh, once again by accident, but you, it was just used with the with keyboards initially. Yeah. Yeah. That, exactly. Like a, like, it's almost like a, yeah, a, or a a volume pedal. Essentially, yeah. He, uh, basically, the tone the tone I just created. So that's. That's the crybaby there. Oops, excuse me. And so the crybaby pedal, essentially, as you rock it back and forth, um, it just uh, uh, there's a there's a resonator, a peak resonator frequency in there that uh, uh, basically adds a mid boost and a tone shift yeah. to uh, to the to your tone. So heel down gives a a really scooped trebly tone, and then he, uh, uh, heel up gives a, a really uh, uh, Adds a lot of bass and and scoops the tone out completely, so it's almost cut out, cuts out all the treble. And then one of the fun things to do is you, if you can just it's because of the sensitivity, you can um, you can kind of find in the middle uh, yeah. a, a nice sweet spot. And the great thing about those pedals is that you're you're in control the whole time. Absolutely. Whereas another pedal, you you push the button and the effect is is there Automatic. and it can't be changed unless you um, are changing it with your hands. In effect, you can't play it. Yeah. So the wah pedal is a, is a classic in that in that sense where you're always in control. Yeah. It's just one of those. It's just when uh, it's it's nice to uh, to add it to other effects, like combine it with other effects, and and also as you mentioned, um, I should have said at, at the beginning, um, all pedals aren't they're not restricted just to guitar. You can use effects pedals with with anything. Yeah. Any instrument well, that you can. Keyboard players use the uh, the Phase 90 a lot and, keyboard and tremolos and, and yeah, so yeah, yeah they're, they're incredibly versatile. So just give us a quick demo of, of, of running a couple together. Yeah, definitely. Uh, before we have some questions with Ben. Um, so let's go. Uh... <laughs> And then uh, you can go tremolo. Let's go tremolo and the phaser. Excuse me, tremolo and phaser. Tremolo is being powered up. <laughs> there we go. So basically, and that's the other thing as well. You can, you could, I could run all of these yeah, that's right. as well, yeah. and it just gives it. You can just get as wacky as you want. You know, it can get a bit dirty. <laughs> As I said, there's three similar sounds in one. Yeah. And the delay is not going to work today, delay. unfortunately. <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. So, Ben, do we have any questions? Uh, first up, we have an email from Tara. 
um, who asks, what should my first pedal purchase be? Oh, that's a that's a lovely that's that's a great maybe. question. I would I would uh, I would ask myself what my personal preference is. It all it all comes down to what you'd like to play. If you like if you like playing rock, I it would be my recommendation to get a distortion pedal. If you like if you like experimentation and and things of that nature, I would I would go for a delay pedal or a flanger. Probably probably a flanger first because that because it's just really fun to get get a modulation feel going and things like that. But otherwise, delay is also really, yeah. really fun in terms of creativity and in terms of uh, if you're just starting out, you can have a lot yeah, of Yeah, I think whatever style of music you're into, and yeah. you'll, if you listen to what the guitarists or people, people players are using, that's probably a good indication of what sort of pedal you'd, yeah. you'd like to start with. Yeah, fundamentally, are, it's just... There are also... Um, uh, effects units which have a lot of different effects available, which is a good way to start to work out what sort of effect you do like, That's a good um, and then you can sort of hone in on single pedals that are much better at, at that particular sound. Yeah, no, very good point. Yeah. Yeah. What are they? Uh, effects. effects. Multi effects. Multi units. effects units. So um, yeah, any like Digitech, uh, Boss pedals, they yeah. make multi effects units. They also have uh, some built-in wah wah pedals as well. So Absolutely, yeah. you can you can get them with with banks or you can get them with expression pedals, which yeah. is just that similar the wah pedal uh, uh, heel. Yeah. So. And then you find which ones you like, and off you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have an email also from Michael who says, "Great show. How can I learn more about effects pedals, uh, the styles, and how they all work together?" Good question, and thank you. Uh, Basically, the the world is your oyster in the internet. Uh, you can just if you go to the the big um, the big companies that that manufacture pedals. I, I enjoy going to uh, the the MXR and Dunlop website. They've got some some fantastic demonstration videos of all of their pedals. Uh, Boss Boss pedals also have some great features on their websites. And uh, what else do I use? I've got Ibanez and Electro Harmonics as well. Basically, anything anything you can find, even uh, if you go to your local music shop, the guitar the guitar um, staff would be able to help you out and point you in the right that's, direction. That's the best way. Yeah, and listen yeah. listen for yourself. Yeah. yeah. Sit, also, sit also there for half an hour with a pedal and get to know it. Yeah. And lastly, I'd imagine um, a, a, a good old guitar magazine. Head to your news agent and um, pick up an issue of Guitar World, which is what I love to do. So yeah. And once again, I I I, I can't stress enough like. Uh, effects pedals are uh, if you if you can if you can um, uh, uh, what am I trying to say uh, if you, in the studio or live if you can get a signal flow going with your instrument even like a, a trumpet or a brass if you can pick that up through a microphone and add effects to the signal flow yeah. you, you can add effects to any instrument so it's not just restricted to to guitars but they are because they are built or or uh, favoured for guitars that's the way I would. Uh, that's the way I'd approach learning more about them. Uh, we also have an email from Brian who says, sounds like studying sound engineering gave you a huge wealth of knowledge on the way sound works. Uh, mm -hmm. Are there any other benefits to studying this? Oh, absolutely. It, uh, as I said, as I said earlier, the, the fact that you can, um, the fact that you can learn about sound broken down into vibrations mm -hmm. and frequencies just gives you a wealth of understanding. Um, uh, uh, basically, any anything anything uh, that um, that everything that I've learned from sound engineering, I've been able to apply to my music, and it just uh, practically, yeah. practically, it just yeah. it gives you uh, it it basically adds to your understanding of, of of music as well. So basically, with my with my theory background, going into study. Sound engineering that gave me a good under that gave me a, that allowed me to have a better understanding or a quicker understanding of sound yeah. and vice versa. From theory, you, you you work off each other. I'm sorry for yeah. the the, uh, the little pause there. I was just trying to <laughs> think right. what it happens. Um, <laughs> it would help you to isolate frequencies that were that were disturbing or you know, the frequencies you didn't enjoy. Yeah. You know, perhaps in a recording studio or just or live, if there's exactly. a certain frequency that's not. That's exactly. not um, pleasing. Then most good sound engineers 
can pick that frequency pretty quick and, Absolutely. and, and make things more favorable for the musician. Yeah. And, and for my, I've, uh, through, through Sound Engineer, I've got some studio and, and live sound work and it, and it just, the, the, the grounding you get from that just allows you to, uh, to really uh, hone your craft. If you can, you can just do whatever you'd like and uh, uh, you, basically you can manipulate your environment to your own yeah. liking and everything like that. It just it, it opens you up to, to endless possibilities. Well, the sound engineer is the driver of the big bus, really. That's it. Yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. So the old saying goes, a band's yeah. only as good as its sound engineer. That's very true. Yeah, but it's great to have a sound engineer who can isolate a problem incredibly quickly oh. so that the creative process can continue. And that's the... Yeah, that's, that's the key. That was another thing. That's uh, one of the best, the best skills I, one of the best skills I learned was yeah. troubleshooting. When you're trying to find out, exactly. a sig when you're trying to figure out a signal flow problem, or a dodgy lead. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Which is probably the most common, as we all know. Yeah. A dodgy lead. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> we will win there. Okay, so we're done with questions. Okay, so thanks for watching the show, the Music Space. It was our tenth episode today. It was great to have Tom Hoffmeyer on. Thanks again, Tom. Great to be here. Great. Thank you. I hope, I, I hope it was enlightening. <laughs> it was. I've, I've already learned some more stuff about pedals that I had no idea about. As you just plug in and play, like most people. So thanks for everyone uh, for watching, everybody. Uh, next week we've got punk rock guitarist Pat Ram on the show. Uh, he'll be talking about networking, playing live, and training your ear. And don't forget, you can continue the conversation on the blog. And so we'll see you next week, same time, same place, on the music space. Ciao. Can we play some more, Tom? Will do. Wait. Exterminate. <laughs> <laughs>